Good evening. I now call our 48th meeting of the Jacksonville Environment and Appearance Advisory Committee to order. Our meeting target time is one hour. I want to welcome everyone to the meeting tonight. My name is Betty Shuffelbein and I serve as the chair for this committee. Um, if everyone could introduce themselves. Matt. Matt Ray, committee member in Tree Board. Dr. Angela Washington, council liaison. Grace Halbrick, member and past chairman. Linda Henderson, uh, committee and tree board. Philip Williams, police department liaison. Millie Grace, of Jacksonville, community engagement department. Stacia Giles, administrative assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan King, city of Jacksonville, planning and inspections department. Uh, Richard Werger for the city manager's office. Clint Hargett with the city. Everyone should have gotten their agenda um we don't have a quorum tonight so we won't be able to um approve, approve the agenda okay, minutes of the april 2019 meeting were provided for your consideration um one, once again we can't make a motion on it you can just with us this evening is our city manager, Dr. Richard Woodruff, who is going to speak to us about the proposed change of attendance requirements. Uh, first of all, Grace, happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and all those folks out of TV land, I know you'll be sending in cards or calling your own phone and singing happy birthday to you. So, but happy birthday. Thank you. So, uh, several years ago, the mayor and council considered uh, matters having to do with attendance and we also considered the overall structure of our various advisory boards. Many of you were on the advisory boards at that time and you remember the restructuring. One of the items that occurred at that time was the establishment of an attendance policy. And what the attendance policy said was that if you miss three consecutive meetings or you miss three of five meetings, you are automatically removed. One of the reasons why that was put in is that at that time we did have difficulty with attendance. We also did not have uh, a, an advisory board program that really was functioning. We had nine advisory boards, many of whom had really no function other than to meet and to listen to the staff. I don't believe you can be an advisor if all you do is meet and listen to the staff because you are appointed by the mayor and council to give them advice. And since the reorganization occurred those years ago, we have found that the five advisory boards that remain have indeed fulfilled, have fulfilled that goal of the council, and that is to give them advice. The work that you do in environmental and in appearance and tree boards and other matters regarding the beautification of the community have really, no pun intended, taken root. And you can see the benefit that your work and your recommendations to the council have brought forth. In the past several months, we've had a number of council members contacted by members of their committees, Dr. Washington being one, where what we had was people who feel like that the attendance doesn't recognize the reality of working people, that many of you have day jobs and that you have obligations. Sometimes those obligations take you out of the community and create a conflict with the night that you're supposed to meet. Council considered several options to address this at a workshop uh, approximately a month ago. And tonight, what I'd like to do is brief you on the proposed changes that the city council has asked us to put in code form. The code has not yet been amended as scheduled. It should be amended with the vote of the council on Wednesday of this coming week, August the 7th. So what I'm going to tell you is still theory. I think it will become reality, but it doesn't become reality until the city council votes on it roughly a week away. First of all, the attendance policy is going to be changed so that there is no attendance policy. What that means is that the current rule, if you meet three, if you miss three straight or three out of five, you're automatically removed. Well, the policy will be changed where there's no automatic removal because there is no required attendance. We believe that most members of the committees are now attending as often as they possibly can. Yes, people do miss, just like this evening we don't have a quorum, 
but we do know that several members of this advisory group contacted Glenn today or earlier this week to say they were out of town on business. Well, once again, under the current policy, that would be counted as an absence. Under the new policy, it will not be counted against you. The second thing, currently you're appointed for three-year staggered terms. Your terms, when you come up for reappointment, will be two-year terms. So, for example, if you're in the first year of a three-year term, you will serve out that three-year term. Then, if you're reappointed, you will then have a two-year term. Attendance stats will be reported. Obviously, Dr. Washington is with us tonight. As the liaison, she knows who is attending and who is not. But approximately 60 days before the end of your term, the city clerk's office will provide data to Dr. Washington that says this particular member out of, pick a number, out of 15 meetings was there 14 of the 15. Or out of the 15 meetings, this member was only there six of the 15 meetings. That will give her, in this case, Dr. Washington as a liaison, the opportunity to decide, should I recommend the reappointment of that person? Because once again, as the liaison, part of her role is to report back to the city council, not just the functions and programs that you're doing, and not only transmit to you the desires of the full council, but her role also is to decide and recommend to the council who should be members of the Environmental and Appearance Committee. So again, her role will then be to formally recommend to the rest of the council. If a person wants to be reappointed, that person, and in this case, since it's Grace's birthday, Grace, I'll use you as the example, when Grace comes up and she wants to be reappointed, she'll contact Dr. Washington. City Clerk's Office will in turn contact Dr. Washington with Grace's attendance record. Dr. Washington will then make a determination, is she going to recommend approval for reappointment and or not? I'm sure in Grace's <coughs> case it would be yes. And then the City Council will make a final decision. We believe that this is a step in the right direction to show that we do recognize that as citizens volunteering and giving their time that you have other requirements and other demands on your life. We also know, though, that it's important for the advisory boards to have as large of attendance every time as possible. To review very quickly, on August the 7th, which is Wednesday of next week, mm -hmm. we expect the mayor and council to change the city code. Mm -hmm. It will remove attendance requirements immediately. Number two, it will also change future appointments to two-year terms. Number three, attendance stats will be taken within 60 days of a person coming up for reappointment. That person will be notified, and that person will be asked, do you want to be reappointed? If you do, you need to contact your liaison. Stats will be provided by the clerk's office, attendance records, and so forth, and then the city council will hear the liaison, in this case, Dr. Washington's recommendation. Any questions or thoughts about these changes? All right, who has the second question about the change? I have one maybe to, um, to maybe um, discuss. Um, so say, for example, if you have a member, um, regardless if it's on my committee or another um, council persons, and that person had a particular extenuating circumstances, but they're interested in um, having a reappointment, would it be feasible for that individual not only to make their wishes known they want to be reappointed, but also to indicate because of what Whatever, I've had an extenuating circumstances. So in, um, in um, debating whether or not I'm going to be reappointed, please take this into consideration. Absolutely. That's an excellent example. <clears throat> uh, we would hope that you as members would always contact Glenn as your staff liaison, Lily as a staff liaison, or Dr. Washington as the council liaison to let them know why you're not going to be in attendance. As I said this evening, we have several members absent. Those members did, in fact, contact Glenn. Glenn has informed, I believe, Dr. Washington on why. I know he has informed me. But it is, you know, what's the old, the old uh, saying is this, the only person in my life who has the right to think I'm clairvoyant is my wife. <laughs> the rest of you have to tell me what's going on. 
Matt, I'm sure that's the same case with you. Is that correct? Indeed. Okay. <laughs> but communication about what's going on in your life is important when you serve on an advisory committee because we do count on people being here. Good, good suggestion. Other thoughts or questions on the changes? How do you feel about them? Well, I'm sure Dr. Washington will speak to the council when this comes up uh, on uh, Wednesday of next week. It's probably on the consent agenda, but I would hope that she would share your feelings to council members before the meeting. So, I don't get an opportunity to, to come and be with you, so if you don't mind, while I was on the agenda just for the changes, uh, I'd like to update you on a few other things that are going on in the life of the city, if you can give me that, that courtesy. We mentioned earlier tonight, uh, Betty made the comment that Gum Branch is looking really great from a paving standpoint. I remind the public that while those roads and streets are inside the city, roads such as Gum Branch, Henderson, Hargett, Western Boulevard, 17, are not actually city roads, they are DOT, roads and streets. On the other hand, the police department and the tra transportation department work very closely with the DOT, and it's through their efforts that we were able to get the work accomplished on Gum Branch. So the DOT is doing it, but it was through statistics, it was through encouragement, communications, that the DOT moved it up on the paving schedule. And I have to admit, it is nice that we don't have to worry about your front end alignment every time you drive on a gum brand. That's really going to be nice when they finish it. On the other hand, Hargett is still, I'm sorry, um, Henderson is still under construction. As you know, on Henderson, the city had a number of water and sewer lines that were in the road, and we had to replace them. So the work that's gone on the last four or five months there has been for utilities and the ownership of the city to be replaced and repaired. We are patching those repair points. We will not see the DOT resurface Henderson though for about five to six months, maybe seven months. What will happen is all the barricades and wonderful orange barrels will disappear. People will drive on all of the bumps and things that were there and the new bumps we've created by putting in the pipes. But the reason why we don't immediately resurface is it doesn't matter how well we pack the trench, there's always settling. So what we don't want is to immediately come in and resurface and then the settling happen and all of a sudden you're driving down the road like this because <laughs> Philip Williams is sitting here, you know, he'll say, I wonder what's wrong with that driver. <laughs> so by letting it settle, then when the spring comes and the DOT comes in and resurfaces it, they will add extra asphalt to that little settlement, and then we will have a very nice, smooth road. As you know, several years ago, we did the same thing with Hargett. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it now, by this time next year, you will have a very good road system with Hargett, Gum Branch, Henderson, and Western all resurfaced by the DOT. Any questions on road projects of any type? Oh yes, the question comes up about Gum Branch and Western, what's happening there? Well, if that's not your normal traffic pattern, you may not be aware that the DOT is now expanding the number of lanes and reconfiguring that intersection. Growth is occurring out in that area. And as growth occurs, it impacts traffic. The more traffic, the more congestion, the more need for more turning lanes, stacking lanes, and those things. So that DOT project will occur for many months, but when it is finished, you'll have a much better transportation movement system there at Western and Gum Branch. Come down the road a little bit on Gum Branch, you may have noticed that we have a new traffic light at the intersection of Gum Branch and Plantation. That is a light that the DOT put in after the city council and the transportation department and the police department uh, really petitioned, provided a lot of data showing the need to improve the safety there. And when we're talking about safety, let's come a little bit further down Gum Branch, down to the intersection where Jacksonville High School is. Mm -hmm. We all are aware of the issues of transportation versus pedestrian. 
in that area. We had some unfortunate instances. We're very pleased that the DOT and the city and the school board have all worked together. The right of way and the additional easements have now been set forth so that probably in September, we will see new traffic signals going in. Technically, they're called the HAWK, H-A-W-K, the HAWK system. But basically, it's nothing more than a red light system. But instead of the red lights being hung vertically, mm -hmm. these are hung horizontally. Mm -hmm. But they function exactly like a red, just exactly like a red light at an intersection. When they go red, you had better stop. Otherwise, something in <coughs> Philip's car will turn on red. <laughs> but again, school is going to be back in before we know it. That's a safety improvement that is much needed. While it will not be functional by the start of school, it should definitely be functional by late September, early October. Okay. Now that covered the first question you had. What was the second question you'd like for me to update you on? Oh yes, the parks improvements <laughs> over at Northeast Creek. Now, Grace, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that because I know you've been out yes. there using the splash pad. That's right. <laughs> now, as you know, the city council has put in two splash pads. The first was at the Jack M. Yet facility that has been very successful. If you've been to Jack M. M. Yet lately, you will also see that we're about to open new restrooms immediately adjacent over at Northeast Creek Park. We're putting in new restrooms, and we're putting in the first uh, splash pad in that neighborhood. And we're also installing the first handicapped accessible playground facility that the city of Jacksonville's ever built. Now, there's a lot of work still to be done on the other side of the street, because at Northeast Creek, we actually consider it two parks, the playground side and the ball field side. Of course, Matt likes to refer to that as the boat ramp side. <laughs> Right? Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but a lot of improvements have been made there. And if you haven't been up by the amphitheater at Richard Gray Park, you should go. We had an event there just this past week that it looked like there must have been 400 people. And one of the requests that we're now having from that is maybe we need to improve our restroom facilities up there. While Port of Johns are certainly um, a nicety. <laughs> uh, no, Port of Johns are a necessity. They're not necessarily a nicety. Right. So one of the requests that's coming forward in next year's capital improvement program will be for the city council to consider building better restrooms for the Richard Ray Park and especially to address the Richard Ray Park portion that is the amphitheater. So that covers the first two questions. We have time for one last question. So who's going to ask that? Chris. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Full of them tonight. <laughs> Any other thoughts about anything? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Surgeon City. Surgeon City. Mm -hmm. We are extremely proud of the fact that earlier this summer, and I believe it occurred July the... June 26th. Okay, June 26th. That's almost July. Mm -hmm. June 26th, we had the grand opening of the Surgeon City building, a dream that the community has had for a long period of time collaborative effort between the city council, the uh, tourism and development authority of the city, and certainly the Sturgeon City Board and so many citizens. But it is now up and running. It is managed and booked by the Sturgeon City staff. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about Grace having a great big birthday party and you're looking for a fabulous place that can house 450 to 500 people, call the Sturgeon City number mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to book it for you. Awesome. We even allow live music and dancing down there, right? <laughs> so, but we do think that's going to be a great asset. It's going to help us put a lot of heads in beds. It's also going to allow many of the military activities where they're looking for a space of that size to occur in the community. Anything else you can think of? With the recent um, installation of the red light at uh, Plantation and Gum Branch, approximately how much nowadays does the installation of a red light cost? Around $250,000. Mm -hmm. They're, so, they're wow. not inexpensive at all. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> on that particular one, because the city had some surplus equipment and because the city staff was able to do a significant amount of the work 
then we did not have to hire a contractor <coughs> as much as we normally would, and therefore that particular intersection did not cost that much. But a typical intersection is going to cost you $250,000. <coughs> Any other thoughts? I know you have a lot of other things you want to accomplish before the hour is completed. Thank you, letting, thank you very much for letting me join you. At this time, if you don't mind, I will uh, exit the building. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. It is now time for our presentation for this meeting. I'm going to turn the introduction of our next guest over to staff liaison, Glenn Hargett. I present to you Ryan King, the Director of Planning and Inspections. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me tonight. I don't know if I'll be able to top Dr. Woodruff. I, I wanted to go in front of him, but I guess I didn't get to set the agenda tonight. So, um, our annual, you know, time with the with the board just to kind of go over, refresh, kind of what we do in planning and inspections, and also tell you a little bit about you know what we're seeing um, on the roadways, along with the new asphalt paving and new signal lights. Um, this department, we it's, it's kind of two divisions. We've got the planning and permitting office and we have the building inspectors. So we are responsible for issuing permits from you know going into an existing building all the way to you know a major new commercial or residential subdivision. And then after those permits are approved and construction begins, begins our building inspectors go out and inspect to make sure that uh, meets the North Carolina building codes. We also schedule uh, inspections for both fire in um, some of their regular routine inspections, as well as zoning code enforcement, who go out to ensure that the zoning compliance uh, is in place with the permits that we've issued. Some permit types that we see on a, basically on a daily basis, certific certificate of occupancies or change of use, change of ownership or name. So if you wanna occupy an existing tenant space, you need to come to City Hall and make sure that the zoning allows you to be there. Make sure that you're not proposing any changes that would not be allowed by the building code um, and work through those processes. And uh, in some cases, you'll need to get a building permit to make those changes to the building. Uh, we like to have that because, uh, especially before you lease or buy something, that way you can make sure that there's not gonna be any hurdles for you. So, or at least if there are any, you kind of know them up front so that you don't buy a building or move into a building only to find out that you're gonna have problems. So, that's kind of the very first step that we tell people, come see us and let's make sure that all that can be worked out. Uh, we also take in stormwater plans, although we're not directly responsible for reviewing those. It comes through um, our re review process. Driveway permits, this is one that a lot of people probably don't realize, but if you want to expand on your driveway or build a new driveway in the city of Jacksonville, there's a driveway permit that you're supposed to obtain to make sure that you're you're constructing that in the right of way uh, per our standards because that is an area where the city maintains we want to make sure that you know you don't ruin the infrastructure before you go back with your own we want to make sure that it meets those standards uh, we administer the unified development and part of that is uh, zoning permits and home occupation permits we allow home-based businesses uh, there's just certain criteria that you have to meet and that requires that you come down and see us and obtain permits in order to, uh, to have a home occupation. We also do a floodplain management. So we don't have a lot of areas in Jacksonville that, that are typically impacted by floodplain permits, but that is another thing that our office looks at to make sure that you build higher than the flood elevation. So make sure that you don't uh, have flooding ruin your improvements that you're proposing to install. We also deal with rezoning requests and development reviews, whether it be site plans, subdivisions, special use permits, or planned unit development, which leads us into um, the building inspections part, which I mentioned already, that uh, the second part of the department, they go out to ensure that after the permits issued by the permitting division, they go out and perform the inspections, um, perform a final inspection with the, the end game being, hey, you want to get open for business with that certificate of occupancy. Uh, that's Those staff also assist with disaster recovery efforts. So after Hurricane Florence, um, after the main part of the storm was over, they came in and helped perform damage assessments, which was vital to kind of turning in, you know, estimates to FEMA. 
They also assist with the zoning code enforcement area for minimum housing cases, whether it be residential code or commercial code. And um, they also, like I said, you know, they're mainly in the field. So upcoming projects, this is kind of the stuff that most people kind of like talking about anyhow, is what's coming in Jacksonville, what's, what's out there being built. Because sometimes we don't know, sometimes we do. For example, of the public signs are up now. So, you know, on the building, so everybody knows which one's the publics and which one's the Michaels and the home goods because the signs on the building have gone up. So Gateway Marketplace is the name of that development, which is, you know, right there north of um, Gateway uh, and Western Boulevard. And um, most of the ones that everybody knows about is the um, Publix and the Home Goods and the Michael and the Ulta. We've also seen uh, a tenant upfit for one of the front buildings on one of the out parcels for Blaze Pizza. And um, I know they have one of those in uh, across from Mayfair at Wilmington. It's some sort of a brick kiln or fire type pizza that uh, my kids love it. We, we've ate there twice now, I believe. So um, kind of make your own, <clears throat> like the subway of pizza shops, kind of make your own, own ingredients and they'll cook it up for you. Uh, CarMax that I believe Jeremy reported on last year, they're still in the works. They're at Piney Green in 17. They've just been a little bit slow to go with it. Uh, River of Life Church is now come out of the ground. That's there. We got a lot of lot of activity there at Cum Branch and Western. Um, Dr. Woodruff mentioned the intersection. You got River of Life Church. I mean, their parking lots have got lights up now. You know, the building, you can see the building there. I'm not sure exactly when they're going to get open, but uh, you can certainly see it sitting there. Yeah. Um, Circle K at the intersection of Gum Branch and Western Boulevard on the opposite side of Lowe's Foods. They are in the process, uh, the site plan process now. Advanced Auto Parts on the Ridgelands Highway side of town. Because of the DOT project that's taking place there at, at NC or Ridgelands Highway, um, Burgo Highway, that area, we've already got the Advanced Auto Parts that's, that's only been here the last 15 or so years. But because of the um, impacts to the driveway, they're actually going to build a new site right there in front of Tractor Supply. Um, Sleep Number and Aspen Dental, the old Century 21 building that they demolished and they're constructing a new building uh, in front of the Shogun. Uh, that's going to be a Sleep Number and Aspen Dental, so that's a two-unit building that they're building. Uh, the, the old Toys R Us is being converted to a uh, Kimbrel's. I said that right, Kim Rules for, uh, Furniture Store. And then um, we've had some interest. We're in the planning processes, or we've approved plans for a hundred and some odd lot subdivision off of Drummer Kellum Road, which is Harvest Meadows subdivisions. And the vineyards is the first phase, about 215 single family lots right there. A lot of us know it as the St. Lawrence Homes tract, uh, but right there at Gum Branch and Western as well. So that entrance to that development will be on Gum Branch Road. So mm -hmm. we're basically beside the River of Life Church. So there's a lot of development activity in that, that general area. Mm -hmm. But the one that's getting ready to open up here in the next month or two, from what we understand, is the, the one that's been probably the most pressing mm -hmm. for us right now is the, um, the Gateway Marketplace. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, about 115,000 square feet. Uh, it's got Publix and some junior anchors and then four tenant spaces. That's on the back part. And then on the front part, there's um, six out parcels. Two are currently under construction. So they've got the concrete board already. The framing's going up. Uh, that's where the Blaze Pizza is going to locate. And also, from what we understand, the Spectrum cable is going to move their customer service center area here away from the industrial area. So um, more convenient mm -hmm. for some, maybe less for others. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's four additional out parcels that we still haven't seen anything come in yet. Mm -hmm. And just another, this is a little bit of a dated drone because you know it seems like they're working day and night out there. So um, talking about traffic signals, you know, you can see they're out there now um, improving their Western Boulevard with turn lanes for um, both on both sides to get into the development. And they're also installing a traffic signal here at, at 
okay, that's not working for me. At um, Marlin and um, Western Boulevard. So there'll be a new traffic light, and um, that's um, they're in the process of installing those right now. The Carmax at uh, Piney Green and 17. Uh, Jeremy, he kind of you know mentioned to me how well I report on that last year, so you'll see it again. So. Um, <clears throat> So that's still in the works. And one other, um, to come back here, at this location, I believe, it, it's either right here at the corner of Henderson and Western or next to Freddy's maybe. Uh, Banfield Veterinary Office, the same one that's in PetSmart, they're getting ready to build a standalone um, veterinary clinic at that location. I don't know if that will be in addition to or take the place of the one in PetSmart. I'm not sure, but uh, we've had some discussions there. Did you have a question? I did. Um, this may be a little bit off target. Has there been any word about if the Mayfly um, Mayflower <laughs> is ever going to come to Jacksonville? Or has that ship already sailed? I think that one is. <laughs> <so awesome. laughs> yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that one's just, um, we'll wait for the next Mayflower to come along. <laughs> um, so some other notable items that, that kind of impact the appearance. Uh, we recently, these are kind of a blur now, we've recently, no, we're getting, we're taking an exterior lighting text amendment to council uh, later this month for some revisions. We regulate exterior lighting. We want to make sure that that our military mission is protected, dark sky standards eliminate light pollution, light spilling over to adjacent property owners, especially commercial next to residential. I wanna make sure that it's not too bright to where people can't sleep in their homes at night. Um, but we're making some tweaks to that ordinance and that will be in front of city council, I believe on the, so the 20th of the August, 20th of August. And then um, the next one that I'm gonna show you some pictures of uh, City Council in 2014 adopted our Unified Development Ordinance, and that was a major overhaul to our to our zoning regulations. And with that code, we created some some minimal design standards for commercial businesses, and um, and it really deals with the appearance of what we're having constructed now. And I've got a I've got two examples that I kind of wanted to share with you, um, along with the landscaping that we now require. Um, which you know is part of the aesthetics and appearance and environmental aspect that we're wanting to make sure that we protect mm -hmm. uh, or at least put back after a site's been developed. Um, this is an Academy Sporting Goods. I just I tried to find one to kind of give an example on the in the top left. The bottom right is the one at Jack's one. You'll notice that they look similar, but we have a glazing requirement, so we require that they put glass on the building. And um, we also have that you basically differentiate and create um, some breaks in the building wall. So you can see instead of just being kind of a flat with an entry, we've got the towers on the ends and just kind of break up the massing of the building. And then the last example is kind of a Burlington, uh, the Burlington Code Factory. Ours is in the bottom right, another example in the top left. And you can see it just has a little bit better curb appeal to it along with the landscaping that we have out front. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those things that we're kind of starting to see the fruits of our labor now that buildings are starting to be constructed since the UDO was adopted in 2014. We've got five years you know, behind us now. And that's why you kind of have a different look to these buildings versus just a concrete block or split face block wall. We've got some, some architectural features to it. Like I said, it's very minimal. Uh, they get, there's about a menu of 10 or 11 items that they have to choose. They, get, you know, they only have to have three of those items but, uh, and then, you know, the glazing, but we think that it's been, you know, it, it makes the community look better. And that's all that I had um, this evening. Uh, the area here on the zoning map, this is all the area where our zoning ordinance or unified development ordinance is applicable. So we're right here in the middle um, at City Hall and um, all the colors represent different zones, residential, commercial, office, and, um, that's the jurisdiction that, that we are responsible for looking over on a daily basis. Anybody have any questions? I do, Ryan. Is there going to be some kind of light or 
the entrance going into Publix from the common and from Gateway, where they can only turn coming from like the recreation center that way and not from the bypass and then making a left going in because there's so many near accidents from people that try and come out that driveway behind Verizon to try and get onto Western and the bypass. And there's there's solid double lines there, but nobody, you know, follows them. So to my understanding, the public's development is not doing anything with the intersection as far as improvements at Western and Gateway North. They are creating a road that ties in from Gateway through city property to get to the backside. And the, the idea behind that is to allow people to get back to um, the parkway at a signalized intersection, although they're gonna have their own signalized intersection at, at Mar uh, Marlin Drive and Western as well. Right, right. But are they gonna, is it just gonna be going out on Gateway there or? It, it, they're going to go both ways. The If you're talking about the new road that's coming in for the public shopping center, yes. that will be a full, you can go left, right, in and out. That's not restricted this time. However, the long-term plans, the parkway is going to go and extend over towards the Ramsey Road area, and that whole area may change once that comes to fruition. But in the short term, it will be a full movement into that driveway on Gateway North. Yeah. I've got a question, right? Just because I was driving down there before this. Shoreline Drive, mm -hmm. there's still a bunch of dark doors down there. What's what's going on with those? That's a great question. Um, there, the, the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is um, something that allows people to sign up for basically a FEMA buyout. And we had... Council basically stipulated that we can't tear down two units of four. So in order for us, let me back up. In order for the program to work, the city has to agree to take part in the program. The city has to agree to upfront the money. The city, the city has to agree to take over the land and leave it open space in perpetuity, but would be reimbursed for the expenses by 75% by the federal government, 25% by the state. So city council said, yes, we wanted to participate. We opened that up for all of our citizens that were impacted by the flood. We had four buildings. Let me make sure I get this right. We had four buildings that signed up, I believe it was. So we're waiting to find out whether we're going to receive the award to buy those units out, which means we would then take them to the ground and they would be forever in this space. The building has four units. Each building has four or so units in it. Correct. Yes, I believe that there's there's 16 people that, six, four full buildings. So we had another building where there was two people of four signed up. We couldn't help them. There was another building where three of four people signed up. We couldn't help them. That was all or nothing. It was an all or nothing deal because we can't take down a building to, I mean, it would just be too, it would be problematic. So we're hopeful that 16 units, four buildings, will receive, we will be awarded the grant to tear those buildings down. So those residents there on Shoreline and the owners of those buildings on Shoreline have been very, very patient. I mean, I, I don't know that I could be as patient as they've been. Um, but we're hopeful that, that in the next couple of weeks, um, we will find out whether we receive that award and then we'll begin the process to acquire those and to demolish those units. And there's timelines that we have to meet. So from start to finish, from storm to the end of the process is a two-year process from what I understand. So once we acquire it, we got 90 days to remove it. So we'll have to make sure that we follow the guidelines that, that, um, and standards that FEMA gives us. But we've got to be awarded first, and, and we're hopeful that we will be awarded that. So that will take care of part of the problem in terms of the units that are dark. And then uh, I know that there's been one or two other buildings to where um, the first building, they actually went in and re uh, renovated the building, and we've got some interest on one or two of the others to do the same thing. 
and in some cases people have sold their their units and somebody's bought them and they're going to go through the rehab process. Currently those areas are not in a flood zone um, even though they flooded. In the, in the new maps that uh, the preliminary flood maps that will be placed in a flood zone but currently there's not any kind of flood limitations that that we're allowed to put on those buildings. So the idea behind the hazard mitigation grant program is to buy the units so that you don't have repetitive flooding in the future. Gosh, thank you. Thank what you. will they do with that property with those four units? Go to grass. It will be grass. I mean, there's very limited items that we'll be able to do with that. Thank you for having me. Look forward to being back with you next year. And mm -hmm. yes. thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> if you will, I'll just go ahead and continue on then. Um, we would call on now uh, Gina Webb for the recognition subcommittee, but I'll tell you that um, obviously, as you mentioned, she's out of town. The recognitions that you folks voted on at your last meeting, which you remember was in early June, um, and we did not have the time to get it on the agenda for the city council meeting that was later in June. And so consequently, it will be presented the August 20th because the council did not meet in regular session during July. So those will be there on the August 20th session. We welcome all of you being there. If you turn <coughs> things on, we will send you another one. The free board meeting and um, Arbor Day um, noted that um, the Arbor Day uh, uh, um, observance is tentatively set for April the 24th. That's the North Carolina Arbor Day observance. And um, it will recognize, should we be awarded the status, 40 years of Tree City USA. And there's been discussions amongst the tree board members about some desire to do special things, not have a single observance, but to, for instance, plant something at you know, schools within the city every, I mean, you know, for during the month of April, or to have something each week or something there, or have other observances. So we welcome ideas there um, as to the location of the actual observance. Um, some have proposed the Sturgeon City Environmental Education Center. There was a discussion about having it Riverwalk Crossing Park. Of course, you'd be, um, you know, a bit weather dependent there. And Northwoods Park Middle School. Uh, Northwoods Park, though, does not have any public space within it right now. They lost the gym, as most of you know. And, um, but there's a lot of interest since that was the first tree planted by the Beautification and Appearance Advisory Committee, uh, the Beautification Commission, um, Beautification and Appearance Commission, excuse me, uh, back when, 40 years ago, to go back there. And there is a specific tree there that was part of the Beirut observance trees because that's where the school helped to really jumpstart that effort. So we welcome conversations with that and want to talk about it. I want to mention to you about this state recycling effort. At the last meeting we mentioned to you that there was a new list from the Sunoco folks about what's recyclable and it's in your packet. But we also brought to you the idea about what this state's going to do. They want to have um, they, were, they were motivated to this by the people who were talking about the increased contamination cost. As you know, the city has to pay when there's garbage that goes across the, the um, scale, obviously. And when we put it in recycling and they, they determine that too much of that load is contaminated with uh, non-appropriate items, we have to pay for that load to be disposed of. So that's a cost that accrues to the city. But throughout the state, they're seeing the same thing. Um, and then recycling news, particularly about China and things of that nature, not no longer taking the items that, the, um, that, that are generated in the United States, and the residents getting confused by the various lists that are out there. So the idea with the state was is to have a unified list, and you folks saw it first. We were one among the first communities to get that list. And they are going to create campaign materials and do things like that. There's going to be social media posts. We're going to post it out. And hopefully some people can, you know, echo those posts and repost and such there. And it's going to be from September 9th through November 15th. And November 15th is America Recycles Day. Does anyone know what today's date, though, recognizes in recycling? Today was the day that the famous barge that was um, of garbage that started in New York City and was headed for North Carolina. Um, couldn't find anybody that would take it. 
And this was the day that it finally got declared a, a disaster, and the court ruled New York had to take it back. And it was that barge trip that um, led to the whole concept that we needed to do something about overflowing um, you know, landfills and to do recycling, and that's when that started. So that was 1985, so quite a thing there. So this is it, and um, we do want to just quickly, remember this was the old list here. These are the new lists that you're seeing here about what it can take. Notice that on those plastic items as it was, no pumps, you've got to empty and rinse them. Um, cans, they're asking you to empty and rinse those. It's all cans, no deal. Glass bottles and jars. Before, you remember it was brown, then it was green, then it was clear. Anyway, you can take them all now, but it's empty and rinse. Um, paper, cartons and cardboard, you flatten the cardboard, please. Mm -hmm. And no food contaminated cardboard. And these are the things that you cannot take. And notably in there, aluminum foil, batteries, clothing, diapers, disposable cups, even though they have a recycling symbol on them, they're not buying them and they can't be done. Electronics, the city is able to take electronics on certain pickups, you know, we've had that. Just call sanitation, they'll pick up your most of your electronics. Anything that's been tainted by food, that's why the pizza boxes can't be picked up and, you know, the box from the Ducks Donut, things like that. And the newest part of this is, is what the words that we've come to find is tanglers. Anything like with cords, Christmas lights, hoses, wires, because it gets in that machinery. Those of you who went out there that day and saw it, that's, that was just death to those machines when that gets messed up in there. And toys. Cannot take the toys. And, of course, tires, there's a disposal fee that you pay anyway, so let the people that put the new tires on your car do that as it was. Um, we will um, briefly do a census, uh, uh, the one city moment now, and then I'll do a census moment here real fast. Um, this is a part dedicated to Matt Ray's father, mm -hmm. and um, it was um, it was it came about, and it wanted to have come after the city had uh, won the designation as an all America city, and so um, some folks that um, knew his father well and wanted to remember him um, helped to create this park that was called the Richard Way um, Park. Well, many of you might know that those signs got there's a there's a there's the plantings out there that represent the plantings from all over the United States. And those signs just um, have not uh, have not weathered well, but today and yet yesterday and today the new signs were installed, and so um, it took a while and they had to get to them and such there. But you can see them; they're pretty substantive signs. They're of the same model that we used in the Lambeth, and those have been out there now for um, for four years and or five years, and they are just really holding up very well. But the nice thing is the frames will be there forever. We can change out the um, the porcelain parts in the, in, the, in the matter there. This one is not a final installation. This is just showing the progress of the installation. <laughs> but Lisa Miller of our staff um, designed these, and um, they, they represent what the regions are, and there's some great stuff. Um, we have some drone photography there that's um, a part of that as it was. So that was part of what our one city is. I want to just mention briefly about the census as we will be um, headed to the census here um, um, you know, in, in March. You'll be getting your cards, um, and we want everybody to encourage that uh, fill them out as soon as you get them. Remember, you can fill them out by, by, um, do, by asking for something in the mail, or you can take that card and go call a phone number and report yourself, or you can go online to the, and use the Internet to, to do that. Um, I will just say that the census goal, obviously, is to count everybody listing. Um, it's required by the Constitution and used for uh, money distribution. And uh, we, we lost basically $1,623 in federal funds for every person not counted in Onslow County, and $205 in funds um, per year for the decade um, of state funds for everyone that was not counted. So if you look at what the fact is of how many people we think were not counted accurately in Onslow County, which was 22,000, that's $357 million over the decade that was not counted here. $45 million of state funds lost because we didn't get that 22,000 people counted here as it was. So that $402 million, think what we could have built in schools or think what things could have happened. Lily's program that she, one of her, her keystone programs she administers is community development. It's totally based on the size of the city that we get to be an entitlement and if we're not. The other part was is that Jacksonville well, the state lost a chance for another congressional seat, but Jacksonville went from ranked 10th in the state to 14th. 
And so people such as Matt that look, deal with people looking for businesses and things such as that, they, they only want to look at, you know, certain ranking, you know this, Grace, too, you know, certain places. And there's an attention that comes to you if you're in the top 10 versus being in the, you know, the top 15 as it was there. But we lost enough that um, that, that went down as it was. So we want everybody to take the pledge to fill out your census and report that. And with that, um, Madam Chair, um, we have nothing more from the staff, um, unless great, um, Lily wants to say something or add to it or whatever. Um, just a reminder that um, on August 26th, we will have representatives from the School of Government here for the site visit for our Country Club Vilas project, our neighborhood revitalization. So Remember the pictures we showed last time? Yeah, we've already acquired three properties, but they're going to help us come up with a strategy for how to revitalize. So. And again, that process is a six-month six month process. There will be some opportunities to meet with board members and residents and, and so forth. And then a report will come out of that that will go back to city council for the, to review their recommendations. We'll keep you posted. These are good things there. And, um, you know, we, we um, your next meeting is October 4th. And um, that, that meeting will have some um, stormwater, um, water quality issues and things such as that as it was. So we want to mention that. And obviously, Philip Williams is here, as you've introduced him at the front. He's going to be doing a presentation for you in December. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll, we'll also have some other activities for you at that time. So, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Okay. If no one has any more questions or there's no other business, um, we'll conclude the meeting. Meetings adjourned. Okay, it's good.